Hello everybody, I'm Nick and this video I'm going to give you 7 tips for writing better .NET library code. This video will focus on the code itself and miscellaneous things around the code and I won't be touching on things like documentation, framework targeting, versioning, symbol files, those things will be covered in a separate video. Here we're only going to focus on the code and even though that's library specific, so your NuGet packages or other packages you share internally in your company, those practices are actually very useful for the code you're writing yourself as well. So don't ignore this video just because you don't write any library code. This video is just an aggregation of all the experience I had with libraries using them, but also building them. I actually was working in a fairly popular library called Cosmonaut, which was an ORM for Cosmos DB. I don't work with Cosmos DB anymore, so that's in the past. But the library itself got pretty good feedback because the API of the library was really good. So I think I can give some advice on the matter. If you like a lot of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell to get alerted when I upload a new video. So let's see what we have here. First, I have just a simple API with control S, mediator and models, your basic weather forecast uh, API. And I'm going to use that to demonstrate a lot of the examples in this uh, video. So the first tip, and this is probably the most important one as well, is make sure your code is testable. And I don't mean like test your own code, make sure the API you expose to the consumer allows them to keep their code testable. What do I mean by that? Well, as you can see, mediator is giving me an interface, an iMediator interface to inject into my controller and then use. And the benefit of that is when the time comes to write unit tests for this class, I can simply mock this uh, iMediator however I want, if I want to mock it, and then allow me to test the rest of the behavior of the method in isolation. This is true for things like auto mapper, which gives you the i mapper, um, auto fixture gives you the i fixture interface, and basically every library, every popular library in .NET will give you an interface to play with, and in some way it will make it very easy for you to mock and test your code when using that library. The exceptions here are things that don't need to be mocked. For example, um, Newtons of JSON, you know those JSON libraries that you might use. It doesn't give you an interface because it doesn't need to. It's a hassle to wire up for something that doesn't need to be mocked. The object to JSON or JSON to object conversion is just part of the code itself. So it doesn't make sense to mock that. You can't achieve something uh, by doing so. However, things like this, which are a bit more complicated and can have dependencies inside of them, um, can be a bit tricky to unit test if they are not mockable. So by giving you an interface to plug into your method, you're making it very easy for the user. Some libraries, for example, if Mediator was a bad library, it would give you a mediator class and then you'd have a static class with a static method and it would technically still work if you wire it up correctly but then you have no way of testing this well actually that's a lie you do have a way of testing this you would have to wrap that into an interface and a proxy class and register that and then call the static methods of the library through that and i actually have demonstrated this in the video you can find in the top right corner of your screen where i take a coding test from an actual interview so you can check that to see how I refactored that away. Now, the second thing is make sure your dependency injection, the approach is not opinionated. You don't bind it to a specific dependency injection framework. What do I mean by that? So if I go into my NuGet packages, you can see that mediator, the one installed here, it's just that mediator. I have nothing else added in my project. It's just mediator and then uh, swagger. And if I go in, into my startup.cs, I have manually wired up mediator here. So I've added mediator as a transient, the I center, the publisher, or the I request handler for each handler in my project. However, this is not what you're probably used to. You're probably used to doing something like this, where you have services.add mediator, and then you use a, a type of in the project uh, for assembly scanning purposes. So something like this. And if you don't know what assembly scanning is, I do have a video for that as well. In order to achieve that, however, in Mediator, you have to add a separate NuGet package. You have to go for mediator.extensions.microsoft.dependency injection. And if I add that NuGet package, then I am allowed... Uh, does it need capital R here? Yeah, it does. So now, as you can see, I can do this, and that means I can remove this bit. However, the built-in dependency injection is just one of the dependency injection frameworks you can use. You might be using Autofact, you might be using uh, Lamar, you might be using any of those other 
approaches for dependency injection, which I don't recommend, but many people do use. So what does Mediator do? Well, it separates the core logic of the library in the core Mediator library here, and then it gives you a separate NuGet package for the dependency injection method, one actually per approach, because it has uh, the Microsoft one, it has the Autofac one, and Jimmy has actually separated them in that way. You can see structure map here. It might be a simple injector and inject. There's one package per dependency injection approach. Now, you don't have to create one per dependency injection approach if the library isn't that popular or if someone doesn't ask for it, but Mediator is a pretty popular library. So it gives you the core without any opinionated approach on the dependency injection matter. And then it gives you a separate package for you to implement the dependency injection in a very elegant way. And the way this is achieved, I can actually um, go into the package itself, is as follows. Let me go here, find Mediator, expand and load it up. So what Jimmy does here is he creates a service factory delegate where the delegate effectively accepts a type and returns an object. Why does he do that? Well, because the whole dependency injection in .NET is driven by a service provider. And actually any dependency injection is driven by that format. The format that in your DI, there is a method that accepts a type and returns an object. For us in .NET, that is the get service or get required service method in the I service provider. So this method, if I call it, and in fact, I'm actually going to show you the get required service. The difference is a get service can return null if the thing doesn't exist in the container, the dependency injection container, um, get required service will throw an exception if it doesn't exist. And if I go here, you can see that, let me just search around for the right uh, overload. Here we go. So you can see that the get required service method is a method, an extension method that accepts a type and returns an object. Exactly the same as the delegate, which accepts a type and returns an object, meaning you can just plug it in, in this delegate, and then wire up your dependency injection like that very, very easily and straightforwardly. And actually this tip was actually shared with my next tip, which is because your dependency injection shouldn't be opinionated, you should give NuGet packages for the dependency injection for the user. The reason why you might want to do this is because you might have complicated service registration for your library. For example, Mediator actually does quite a bit of assembly scanning. If I go in here, searching using a marker to register everything that it wants like the iMediator, the iSender, um, all the notifications, all the handlers. And as you can see, it adds required services here. And that's quite a bit of registration that you would have to know about. And yes, you can look in the documentation on GitHub if you want, but you shouldn't have to, right? So give me a separate NuGet package, which implements the dependency injection. If your dependency injection approach is pretty complicated and then do that for me. And this can really, really make it way more straightforward for users to actually use your library because in your documentation on GitHub, you can say, just download this separate NuGet package and use the add my library method. And that really, really helps them use the library. If you don't do that, then please make sure that you explain in detail how they can register your thing in DI. The next one, and it's very, very important is cancellation tokens. When you make your library, part of someone else's code, then they're putting the trust to you to make sure you do things the right way. They probably haven't looked at your source code. They know what your library does and they use it because it makes their life easier. So on your end, you have to take decisions for best practices and that includes cancellation tokens. For example, Mediator in the handler, it will automatically add a cancellation token in the handler itself, which means the user, for example, here in the controller can do the following. They can say cancellation token and then they can pass it to Mediator. And then Mediator will use that. And if the request is canceled, then the handling will be canceled itself as well, assuming you pass it down to whatever you're calling. Obviously, this only applies to things that can physically get canceled. For example, you're making an IO call somewhere, or you have some logic with internal awaiting that you might want to cancel. But it's a good practice that if your thing is doing some processing and that processing can exit early uh, due to a cancellation, then simply give them a way to pass down the cancellation token. I have seen so many times libraries that don't do that. And it's just a no, no for me to use. I just cannot use it because it just breaks my whole cancellation token passing flow. And on that same tip, since people put the trust in you to do things right, 
you should also really take care of performance as well. Remember, people are only interacting with the public side of your library. So if the private ones are really poorly written and they profile their application because they need to solve any performance issues and they see your library underperforming, then they will just ditch it. So next tip, and that's so, so important for libraries, please use inline documentation. What is inline documentation? Well, it comes in many forms, but basically your classes can have summaries. They can have so many other things. They can have examples, exceptions, lists. Um, you can inherit documentation from whatever class you're inheriting from or interface. You can have parameter names. You can give so much description to your library code through those summaries that the user doesn't have to go to a separate website to know how to use your library. For example, Mediator here, if I go into the, the controller and I see the send method and I do this, it tells me what the method is doing. You can see asynchronous sends a request to a single handler. It tells me what the type parameter is. It tells me what the request object is, what the cancellation. Now, obviously those are not very lengthy descriptions because there's nothing fancy going on here, but Microsoft themselves in their own code, they use them extensively. For example, what is the I action result where it says it defines a contract that represents the result of an action method. And then it gives you a link here and you can click on that to go to the website exactly telling you. In fact, I just clicked that and it brings this page up with the documentation. These are things you can use and this is how you can do it. There's so much information on the subject and people just don't use them and they should because it can really, really save time having to go somewhere else to search about what this type or what this parameter or what this result is supposed to be. Now, the next one is so, so important. Make sure you use your access keywords properly. Not everything needs to be public, especially when you're writing library code. In fact, most of the things in your library code should be either internal or private. You should not be leaking anything to the user because the moment you leak something as public, they can use that. And then if you change it, you just broke their code. And that's a breaking change requiring a major um, library versioning bump. So from 1.0 to 2.0, just because you broke the API. Libraries do have an API. It is whatever you're exposing publicly. For example, in Mediator, if I go here, actually, let me just find the assembly again. As you can see, it has an internal folder here with a bunch of things that are marked as internal. This cannot be used and, and private as well. This cannot be used by me. I cannot just go in here and say new object details. This, I just don't have visibility to that. And the author has done that because I should not know about this. This is not something that should concern me. So unless I can use something, don't leak it to me through your library. Because if I use it, then you're screwed. You broke my code. You broke the trust we have through the contract that we agreed on when you made this public, and then I'll stop using your library. So yeah, make sure you use those keywords. See, internal is such a big one. Uh, some people also don't want uh, other people to extend their classes. So they're sealing their classes as well. That depends on your library, so I won't give you an advice to make everything sealed by any means. But internal should be used when you don't want to give the user that part of your code. That's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making these videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video. Subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.